Today on Alex Nautos, we are out here taking a look at the 2016 Audi A6. Now, the A6 is a mid-sized luxury sedan. Now, for 2016, Audi has significantly refreshed the A6. This is actually not a complete redesign, but a significant refresh. So the vast majority of the vehicle under the skin is actually the same as it was before. The A6 wears Audi's latest front end look. We get these more aggressive looking headlamps right here. They are standard HID optionally LED like our model has right here. The major change to the grille is that we now have slightly harsher corners around each of the edges of the grille. This is very similar to what we see in the brand new Audi A4 as well. In terms of overall length, the A6 is just over 194 inches long, which means this is only slightly larger than a Honda Accord and actually a little bit smaller than a Toyota Avalon. That usually surprises our friends in Europe who normally consider something like this to be a fairly large sedan. In the United States, this actually isn't. It actually is a decent amount smaller than several Buicks, things like the Chrysler 300, etc. Part of the reason that surprises people is because this is actually one of the larger vehicles in its category. In fact, really only vehicles like the XF and the Genesis are larger than this. I'll let you consult that chart down there at the bottom of your screen. The big difference, of course, between this and most entries in the segment is that the A6 starts as a front-wheel drive vehicle. However, most versions available are all-wheel drive. That base model being front-wheel drive and the general design of Audi's Quattro system is why we get the proportions that you're seeing right here up front in the vehicle. We have a slightly longer overhang and we have a slightly larger distance between the front wheel and this door than we find in many of the other entries in this particular segment. A lot of people incorrectly conflate a front heavy weight balance with a front wheel drive bias. The Audi A6 is always going to be a little bit front heavy when you compare this to the BMW 5 Series or Mercedes-Benz E-Class. However, this does have a rear wheel drive bias just like an E-Class or a BMW 5 Series. It's all because the engine is actually in front of the front axle in this vehicle that we get that front heavy weight bias like you'd find in something like an Acura RLX or a Volvo S80. However, the S80 and the RLX are always going to be front heavy and front wheel drive biased. This vehicle is not. It's always gonna be front heavy, but actually most versions are actually rear wheel drive power biased. Audi's design language has always been elegant and conservative, but I think that they've escaped boring like we find in certain versions of Jaguar's XF, especially the last generation of the XF. It was always a little bit less exciting than the Audi. We have these new tail lamps, which are all LED in all models, and they have this sort of uh, you know, Y shape going on right here. Curves around and then splits here and then goes top and bottom on the lens. It's an attractive look. And then we have dual integrated exhaust tips at the bottom. Overall, I think the Cadillac CTS and the Mercedes-Benz E-Class are actually the most attractive entries in this segment because they're the most visually exciting. This vehicle, as well as the Jaguar, tend to go for more sedate, more elegant and restrained lines. And the Mercedes-Benz and the Cadillac are definitely going for something bold, which I think really speaks to my heart. Let me know what you think about the look down there in the comment section down below. There are a wide variety of engines available in the A6 worldwide, and we only get a few of them in the United States, but it's still a larger selection than you'll find in some of the competition. Things start out with a two-liter four-cylinder engine. It's very similar to what we see in other Audi models, only in this model it produces 252 horsepower and 273 pound-feet of torque. Now it's still arranged in the same direction you're seeing right here, so it actually is north-south in the vehicle, not across the front axle. And that is quite different than something like that Acura RLX or the Volvo S80, even though that two-liter turbo model does start out as a front-wheel drive vehicle. The base transmission in that two liter turbo is a seven speed dual clutch transmission in the front wheel drive form. If you opt for the Audi Quattro system, then we do get a ZF eight speed automatic. The model we're taking a look at here is a three liter supercharged V6 engine. It produces 333 horsepower and 325 pound feet of torque. This engine's made it only to that ZF eight speed automatic and standard Quattro all wheel drive. Now the rumor mills tell us that we may see this engine replaced at some point soon with Audi's new three liter turbocharged V6 engine that produces a little bit more horsepower and a decent amount more torque. The next engine up is Audi's three liter turbo diesel, which is not caught up in the Dieselgate scandal at the moment. That produces 240 horsepower and a whopping 428 pound-feet of torque. Performance is actually only a little bit slower than that three liter supercharged V6. Again, like the three liter supercharged V6, it's mated only to the standard eight speed automatic and Audi Quattro all wheel drive. If you opt for the Audi S6, then you get a four liter turbocharged V8 engine producing 450 horsepower, 406 pound feet of torque, and then we go back to the seven speed dual clutch transmission, but it gets standard all wheel drive as well. Fuel economy comes in at 24 miles per gallon city, 35 highway and 28 combined in the two liter turbocharged model if you get the front wheel drive version. And of course it drops down to 24 miles per gallon combined with this model, 21 miles per gallon combined in the S6. 
If you want the best fuel economy in this particular vehicle, or actually in this segment, it would be the three liter turbocharged diesel engine, and it does match the Lexus GS Hybrid in real world driving. Front seat comfort comes in at eight out of 10 points. We do have a multi-way adjustable driver's seat with a four-way adjustable lumbar support, and a two-way adjustable headrest. We also have a two-position seat memory on the door and a tilt telescopic steering column that is manually adjustable by default, power adjustable in our particular model. Now I give this eight out of 10 points because you do find seats like the BMW 5 Series with the multi-contour seats that are going to be more comfortable than the version we're taking a look at here. They do have an extending thigh cushion and you can change the articulation of the seat back that does make them more comfortable. When it comes to the rear seats, I'm going to give this 10 out of 10 points. The A6 has long had one of the most comfortable back seats, and that continues in this generation. I have about four inches of legroom left with the front seat adjusted for me, and I have an incredible amount of headroom for this category, about a full inch in the back. That's even taking into account the relatively swoopy side profile the A6 gives us. We also have air conditioning vents right here on the B pillar of the vehicle and air conditioning vents in the center and our model has the optional four zone climate control. Now standard in this model is a three zone climate control system, which is relatively unique in this segment. Moving over to the middle seat, things are a little bit less comfortable because the center seat is a decent amount higher off the ground than these outboard seats. That means that my head is touching the ceiling and it is a little bit further forward than the outboard seats as well. It makes you feel like you're sitting a little bit in front of everybody else. Now, if I move all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, then you'll notice that we are still in a smaller car than you'll find in large sedans in the United States, something like that Chrysler 300 or certain Buick models. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks for a six foot five passenger, and my knees are touching the seat. Rear seat passengers do get a softly padded center armrest with a built-in storage cubby right there. You can put things like that inside and cup holders integrated into the front. Now you'll also find fold down seat backs in this vehicle and these fold completely flat with the cargo area in the back. Taking a closer look at the interior, we have these four-way adjustable headrests. These move in and out as well as up and down by pressing this button right here on the side. And we also have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger. Our particular model not only has perforated leather, but we also get ventilated as well as heated seats. Perhaps due to the size of the A6 or just the general design, you'll notice that we have front doors that seem a hair smaller than the doors we find in the 5 Series or the Cadillac CTS. That's most noticeable right over here on this side where my finger is pointing. Now, if you're a taller person or you just like having your seat all the way back in its tracks like this seat is right now, you'll notice there really isn't anywhere for your elbow to go, and that's because the door ends right up there and your elbow would end up right around here around the B pillar. The front doors are composed almost entirely of soft touch plastics, and we have this large section of real wood trim right up here, which we'll take a closer look at in a second. We have a relatively large armrest down there, as well as bottle holders and some additional storage below. Audi has long been known for their attention to detail as well as their fit and finish in their cars. And that continues in this A6. You can really see how good this wood trim looks. It is a real wood trim and it's also an open pore wood trim, so it's not heavily lacquered or varnished. If we move over here to the sun and then zoom on in, you can see that you can really see the grain in this wood. It's very attractive. Moving over to the dashboard, you can see that that theme continues. We have more open pore wood trim along here. The swooping theme from the doors also is mirrored on these vents on the dashboard. And we have a relatively large glove compartment over here on the passenger side. We do have a two tiered affair. So right up here, there's some additional slots and you can't put the instruction manual on those top tiers. We do have a valet button right over here as well. The center of the dashboard is dominated by the Audi MMI screen. And like other Audis, this screen actually retracts into the dashboard. It'll do it when you turn the car on and off or when you press this button right over here on the dashboard to do it manually. This is a relatively smaller screen than we find in some of the competition out there. However, it is a nice high resolution display. Below the air vents, we have a single disc optical disc player right here. The open button opens this little door to reveal your SD card slots, SD1 and SD2, as well as the SIM card for the connected services that are part of MMI. We have our start, stop, enable, disable button right here, parking sense button. This is the rear window shade, and this is the traction control disable button. Below that first line of buttons, we have the controls for our quad zone climate control system. Although it looks like we only have two zones right here, these buttons will actually be used to also control the two zones that are in the rear of this vehicle. You do that in coordination with these controls and the Audi MMI system. We can click the sync button right down here to sync all four zones with the driver's side. Below that, we have a small storage cubby down here. Now, I wasn't able to fit a wallet or an iPhone 6 inside. It was just barely too small. You'll also notice that right over here, we find the controls for our ventilated seats. 
Continuing down, we have an electric parking brake. This is the touchpad for the Audi MMI system. Right now it's just displaying numbers one through six because it also functions as radio preset buttons. This is a very traditional console shifter right here. We click down again for sport or drive to change that mode. We move over to the right for the manual mode, up for up and down for down all the way over to the left again, and then all the way up for park. You'll also find the rest of the controls for Audi's MMI system down here. We have direct access buttons for navigation, for telephone, and you'll see the light turns on right there. Now, these are contextual buttons on either side of this controller knob. So if we click on these particular buttons, these correspond to options that are on the screen. So that lights up to show me that I'm in that option. If I go back, you'll notice that I cannot click this upper button right here, it does nothing because it's contextual and in the context the MMI system is in right now, it's not actually an option. This knob simply rotates around and clicks down, it does not toggle up, down or side to side. We have a menu button, back button, direct access to vehicle settings right there. And then over on the right side of that is where you'll find the track forward, backward, volume knob and power button as well as the start stop button for the vehicle. Continuing behind the MMI controls, this is where you'll find the two large cup holders that we have in the A6. Like other Audi versions, we have very large and functional cup holders right there, just in front of the center console storage area. The center armrest is softly padded. It's also adjustable for height. It ratchets into position, as you can see there, and it opens to reveal two separate storage areas. The first section right there is relatively shallow. We can put wallets and other small items right there, and we open it the rest of the way to reveal our 12-volt power outlet, a shallow storage area, coin holder, two USB ports, which is a little bit different for Audi. We no longer use that Volkswagen and Audi proprietary connector. We just use regular old USB connectors and a stereo mini auxiliary input. Over on the driver's side, we have this very attractive two dial instrument cluster. You'll notice that the engine temperature as well as the fuel gauge are these little bands of LEDs on either side of the speedometer or the tachometer. We also have a large full color LCD positioned right there between the speedometer and the tachometer. That display is controlled via this button and knob arrangement on the left side of the steering wheel. We use this to toggle back and forth between option sets on that system. We use this to scroll through some of the options, click down to enter, and then this brings up auxiliary menus within that same interface. Zooming in on that multifunction display, you'll notice one thing right away. We actually have a navigation map. We also have satellite imagery on this map, as you can see right there, as well as traffic information. It zooms via those controls on the steering wheel, and of course it will show you turn-by-turn -turn directions if you do have navigation enabled. Via the pop-up menu, we can choose a compass view if you're a little bit more comfortable with that, or we could actually tell it to bring us home if we did have a home address stored in the system. If you were actively navigating somewhere, you could have it cancel your navigation as well. Moving over to the left, we have our Bluetooth phone interface, and you see you can actually pull people out of your list and call them right there. Moving over one more, we have our Sirius XM radio station list right now because we're on Sirius XM. If I change over to the multimedia interface, you'll notice that we have direct access to the current playlist that we have right here in the system. Moving over once more, we have our typical trip computer information. We have long-term memory, short-term memory, and all the regular trip computer functions that we've expected out of Audi. Moving above that instrument panel, you'll notice that our model also has the optional heads-up display. Now, the only thing I dislike about this is that it does cause a relatively unattractive hump to be installed right here on the dashboard. So the normal dashboard wouldn't have this particular module, and it's not integrated as well as I would like. Definitely not quite as well as we see in the BMW 5 Series. Now zooming in on the heads-up display, you can see that right now we're getting just the current speed, which is of course zero miles per hour. It'll also give you turn-by-turn -turn directions as well as information on your cruise control. It does not, however, give you multimedia information like we do see in some of the competition. Moving out to the steering wheel, we have this very attractive three-spoke design. We have sport grips right up top and then sport bump outs on the bottom outside rim of the steering wheel as well. Volume knob right over here with a mute, click down to mute voice command button, repeat navigation instruction button, and this of course is that control panel for that multifunction display right there between the speedometer and the tachometer. Here we have the optional heated steering wheel button. Now an interesting thing is that this car actually remembers whether you had the heated steering wheel enabled or disabled, and when you power cycle the vehicle, it will return to its last setting. On the back of the steering wheel, we do have paddle shifters up on the right and then down on the left, and you'll find the cruise control on a stock right over here on the left side of the steering column. When it comes to the Alex Nauto's exclusive trunk comfort index, we score nine out of 10 points because the A6 does have a very accommodating trunk. We also have some nice touches back here like grocery bag holders that descend out of the back. We also have a power trunk hatch right here and a very easy to reach manual hatch if you don't opt for that power trunk lid. Overall, this does score a little bit below the Hyundai Genesis.
As with every vehicle in this segment, acceleration varies greatly depending on which version you get. If you get that 2.0T model, it's a little closer to 7 seconds in the front-wheel drive form, a little closer to 6 seconds in the all-wheel drive form. The 8-speed automatic transmission not only gives you that quattro all-wheel drive for better grip, but it also has slightly more advantageous ratios. The A6 3.0T that we're taking a look at here ran from 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds, which is relatively swift for this segment, so I'm going to give this model a B. Now, if you want to go faster, that S6 will do it in 4.4 seconds. Now you should know that this is a little bit faster than the E350, the CTS 3.6, or the GS350. However, it is not as fast as something like a CTS V Sport, or a BMW 535i, or even that brand new Jaguar XF. The reason is, of course, because the new XF is almost all aluminum, and it's about 450 pounds lighter than the A6 we're driving here. When it comes to braking, I'm going to give this an A-. Braking distances were 111 feet in this model with the optional wider tires. Now, if you get the standard tires, then braking distances are a little bit longer. The lighter entries in this segment, specifically that Jaguar XF, are likely to brake a little bit shorter than this, but the stopping distances in this car are actually quite impressive, especially with these wide tires. In terms of overall handling, I'm going to give this a B+. I actually like the way this car drives because I am quite partial to all-wheel drive vehicles in general. However, I do have to admit that there is a weight balance problem going on in most Audis like this. Now, problem is probably a harsh word to use in this instance. However, you can feel it. So when we're out on a winding mountain road like we're on right here, in these corners, you can feel the A6 pushing a little bit towards the outside of the corner, and it doesn't respond quite the same way that a rear-wheel drive vehicle would respond. Now, again, I'm kind of a fan of all-wheel drive, so I would actually take this vehicle and its driving dynamics over a rear-wheel drive car in most circumstances. However, I have to admit that it doesn't handle as well as the rear-wheel drive entries in this segment. So a rear-wheel drive 535i or a rear-wheel drive E350 or even a Lexus GS350, they would all handle and feel better than the model we're taking a look at here. Now, Audi helps compensate for the front-heavy tendencies of this vehicle by giving this car very, very wide tires, and that works very, very well. When it comes to the ride, I'm going to give this model an A- minus because we do have those low-profile, wider tires that does exact a little bit of a toll on the ride. However, this suspension is very, very well sorted, and it never feels unsettled over broken pavement. Overall, it feels a little bit firmer than I would like, but very, very nicely done indeed. Now, the S6, interestingly enough, actually gets a slightly better ride score in my book because it uses an adaptive air suspension, and that adaptive air suspension actually helps soak up more of the bumps than the traditional spring setup we're driving right here. Cabin noise came in at 69 decibels at 50 miles an hour, which is a very, very good cabin noise score for this particular segment, so I'm going to give this an A. In general, supercharged engines don't perform quite as well when it comes to fuel economy as turbocharged engines, and of course, the A6 is relatively heavy for this segment, and all-wheel drive is standard. Therefore, I'm going to have to give fuel economy a C. I've been averaging 22 miles per gallon in mixed driving in this vehicle, and you will find a few more miles per gallon out of the Lexus GS, the BMW 5 Series, the Jaguar XF, etc. The XF is actually quite efficient for this category, even though it also uses a supercharged engine because of its light curb weight. The steering in the A6 is a little bit heavy, it can be a little bit numb at times, and the front end of the car can plow in the corners just a little bit, but overall the A6 is a very competent and fun to drive sedan in this category. Most vehicles in this category do have electric power steering these days, so there's not going to be that much variation in terms of power steering feel. Adding all-wheel drive to the other entries in this segment, which is becoming more and more common these days, the feel also will be relatively similar to the Audi, although the Audi will always be a little bit more front heavy than many of those other vehicles. Before we dive straight into pricing, you need to know that there are a large number of standard features in the A6 that we don't see in all of the competition. Like we get standard three-zone climate control where the rear passengers get their own separate climate zone. Four-zone climate control like our model has is available. We also have standard xenon headlights. Again, LED headlamps are optional and we get standard leather seats. Now standard leather is something that used to be associated with all luxury branded vehicles regardless of the price tag, but that's no longer true and many luxury vehicles even in this $60,000 starting area are now getting standard pleather seats. Now all that happens for $46,200 on the 2 liter turbocharged front wheel drive model. 
Now, front wheel drive is important to keep in mind when we start discussing the competition. If you want to add all wheel drive, which does send the majority of the power to the rear wheels, interestingly enough, that will cost you $48,400 on that same two liter turbo model. If you want the model we're taking a look at here, that started at $57,400, and as we have equipped here, it's just over 65. The TDI starts at $59,500, and the S6 starts at $70,900. Now let's talk about a few essential options on the A6. I definitely think the driver assistance package is worth the $2,250 available on most trims. It includes radar cruise control, pre-collision warning, and a number of other safety features that I think are very handy. I'd probably skip the night vision assistant and the heads-up display in this particular vehicle. Overall, the side rear airbags are $350 well spent because these actually augment the standard curtain airbags we see in this model. Most vehicles now have side curtain airbags, but they don't really have anything to protect the side of the passenger between the hip and the chest area, and that's exactly where those airbags come in. I'd also get the 8-speed automatic transmission on the 2-liter turbocharged model because otherwise it does handle just like any other front-wheel drive vehicle. You add that 8-speed automatic and Quattro, and it just doesn't anymore. The Bose stereo system for $850 I think is also a good upgrade over the base sound system, but I would skip that nearly $5,000 Bang & Olufsen sound system. It does sound better than the Bose system unquestionably, I just don't think it sounds about $5,000 better. BMW's 528i starts at $50,200 and it's going to be about $4,000 to $5,000 more than the A6 2.0T. It also doesn't have leather standard. Now on the flip side, it is rear wheel drive standard and this is front wheel drive standard. So the driving dynamics are going to be very, very different and the 5 Series is much more dynamic. It's more fun to drive out on the road. Of course, if you add BMW's X-Drive all wheel drive system to the 5 Series, then it's actually going to be fairly similar to the A6. It is still going to be more neutrally balanced than we find in this particular model, but it's not going to make that much difference for the average person. If you're really driving your car hard out on a favorite winding mountain road, you will notice that this front end will tend to resist turning a little bit more than the 5 Series. The 5 Series is going to feel a little bit more nimble, a little bit lighter. Now when we start taking a look at this particular model, this would compete with the 535i, and that 535i does start a little bit less. It starts at $55,850, $58,000 if you want the all-wheel drive system. Now that's going to be about one to $2,000 less expensive than the Audi. However, we actually get more standard equipment in the Audi, and that actually flips the balance one to $2,000 in favor of this vehicle. The Mercedes E-Class is the other direct competitor, obviously, since all three are from Germany. The E-Class starts a little bit differently, however. Instead of a 2-liter turbocharged engine, we get a 2-liter turbo diesel engine, and it's going to be about $6,000 more than the base version of the A6. Things just get more expensive as you continue to go on up. The E350 is $53,150, and its performance slots between the 2-liter turbocharged version of this and the 3-liter supercharged version. If you want the V6 turbo over there from Mercedes, you're going to have to shell out $63,100 for that model, and then an extra $2,000 if you want all-wheel drive like we find on this particular car. That's about an $8,000 bump over the A6 we're testing right here. One thing's for sure, however, that E-Class definitely feels old on the inside. Its infotainment and navigation system is definitely behind the times, and it is significantly more expensive than the Audi. The GS350 is $48,200, and that's actually $2,000 more expensive than the Audi A6 with the 2-liter turbocharged engine. Now, it is rear-wheel drive, and it is slightly faster than that base A6. It's also more dynamic because it's rear-wheel drive but the interior is a little bit more boring. Now the 3 liter supercharged A6 we're testing right here is about $7,000 more expensive than that Lexus GS. Of course, the Lexus GS is likely to be less expensive to own and operate, less expensive to insure, etc. If you're comparing fuel efficient models, then the TDI is actually less expensive than the Lexus GS hybrid. It's about the same speed, zero to 60, and you get about the same fuel economy as well. Jaguar's XF is all new for 2016, and it's also all aluminum this time. It's about 400 pounds lighter than the version we're taking a look at right here. It's also a little bit less expensive, starting at $51,900 for the 340 horsepower version. Now at the moment, there is no 2-liter turbocharged 4-cylinder engine version of the XF, although we do expect one soon. The XF is by far the more dynamic entry in this particular segment, largely because of its solid rear-wheel drive dynamics and that very, very light curb weight. Of course, with Jaguar, we do have some lingering questions about reliability, so you may pay more in long-term maintenance costs than that Jaguar XF, 
I don't think it's quite as exciting looking as the current generation Audi form. Cadillac's CTS used to be an A6 fighter for A3 prices, but that's no longer happening these days. It now starts at $45,345, which is only a $1,000 discount over the Audi A6. Now it does come as a rear wheel drive sedan standard with better driving dynamics than the base A6. On the downside, it does use a standard 6-speed automatic transmission. You don't get the 8-speed until you move up to the V6 engines. Now, Cadillac suffers from a few highs and lows when it comes to the CTS. That base 2-liter turbocharged engine is a great engine, but then they stick it with a 6-speed automatic transmission, so it doesn't have the performance that we find in the other 2-liter turbos in this segment. The next engine up is also a 3.6-liter naturally aspirated V6 engine. It definitely is behind the times when you compare it with the rest of the competition. But then we have the Cadillac CTS V with its twin turbocharged 3.6 liter V6 engine and an 8-speed automatic transmission, it easily outperforms the Audi S6 in most ways. Largely because, of course, it has a better weight balance. It's nearly a perfect 50-50 weight balance. It really is trying to be a BMW M-series car for less money. And that's, of course, before we even talk about the new Cadillac CTS-V with its absolutely insane V8 engine. Exactly where that Cadillac CTS slots with the A6 really depends on how you plan on configuring each of those models, because some definitely score below this and some actually score above the A6. Then we have the Hyundai Genesis, which is perhaps one of the more interesting entries in this particular segment, because it is a rear-wheel drive luxury vehicle from a non-luxury brand. $38,000 buys you the base V6 version and rear-wheel drive, if you want their 5-liter V8 engine, that will set you back $51,500 or about $56,000 fully loaded. That means a fully loaded Genesis with all the options like radar cruise control and LCD instrument cluster, all that sort of thing going on, it will be significantly less than a similarly equipped version of the A6. The big things to know about that Genesis are that the base V6 engine comes across as a little bit unrefined, whereas the V8 engine is a little bit thirsty when you compare it to the supercharged and turbocharged six-cylinder engines that we see in this particular segment from most entries. However, that V8 engine sounds great and the performance is actually incredibly good. The biggest thing to know about the Genesis, of course, is that you do have to go to a Hyundai dealer to buy one and it will have a Hyundai logo on the car. Then we get the Acura RLX, which is actually one of my least favorite entries in this particular segment, mainly because of pricing. The Acura RLX is quite expensive for what you get, especially since the RLX is basically always a front-wheel drive vehicle. Now, if you do get the Acura RLX Hybrid, it is quite expensive, and they just add electric motors to the rear of the vehicle. They don't actually change anything up front, so it's not a mechanical all-wheel drive system. That means that you still get torque steer, you still get the driving dynamics of a front-wheel drive car under most circumstances. The Acura also doesn't come standard with things like wood trim that we find in basically every other luxury entry, including that Hyundai Genesis. Audi's strong value proposition is very noticeable when you compare this to something like the Lexus or the Cadillac, which are two brands definitely known for their value pricing in this segment. The Audi A6 really holds its own, being only a little bit more expensive, or in some configurations actually slightly less expensive, especially than that Lexus. Of course, if you are looking for a bargain in this segment, then the base A6 is out-bargained by that base Volvo S80. 2-liter turbocharged engine produces about the same kind of power, we have about the same kind of performance, slightly better fuel economy for about $3,000 less, or if you want about the same price as the A6, we get a nicer interior. Now the infotainment system isn't going to be quite up to snuff in that S80, and it is going to be replaced soon, but I think that S80 is quite attractive. Now this segment is going to become much more crowded because Alfa Romeo will likely have a mid-size sedan in this category relatively soon, and of course we have that new Maserati as well. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2016 Audi A6. Go ahead and click those related videos down at the bottom of the screen. Find me over on Facebook and at Twitter, and I'll see you next week.